try my commanding presence mode here, just, just beginning quietly. Um, I'm Roy Sorensen, and I will be introducing our speakers. Um, so we have um, Peter Graham, uh, who you can't hear me. Well, then I've got to more boldly project. Uh, we have uh, a co-authored uh, presentation, uh, Peter Graham and David Henderson. The, uh, um, so we have, uh, uh, actually, I, I was thinking about Peter as I was swimming this morning. I, I swim and I listen to an audio book underwater. And I had just been reading about um, this reliabilism and how the, you know, uh, very skillfully presented, you need sort of, Maybe you're even getting it wrong, but if it's an abnormal conditions, we give you a pass. Uh, well, the, 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 the audio book had this story about um, the Indians uh, meeting the Apollo 11. These are, these are, they were Indians in Arizona, and they were meeting the Apollo 11 astronauts as they were preparing to go to the moon. And the, Indians, the Indian found it very interesting that they were going to go to the moon, and he, he wanted them to convey a message because the lunar spirits are hard to communicate with and it's convenient now that they had the astronauts going up there and it would have to be a secret message and so you they they taught you know he they were taught the message very carefully just phonetically uh, and they said but what is the message and so it can't reveal it's, it's a tribe secret so the Apollo 11 guys went back and they they finally, they finally found someone who was bilingual and had loose lips. And so they asked, well, what, 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 is, what are we saying to the, the lunar spirits? And, and what they were saying was, do not believe anything these men say. They are out to steal your land. <laughs> yeah. right. So that's what I'm hoping for from illumination and all this stuff about testimony. What went on right there? Uh, so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna let uh, David sorry take some time to uh, David take over and to speak with us on epistemic norms and the epistemic game they regulate. So can you hear me? Sounded like it. If you've looked at the handout, you're probably already worried. Uh, I am too, but if we kind of work together, I think we'll get through this. Um, so from Peter, you've, you've got the idea of uh, social norms. I should say just a little bit there. Um, Bicchieri, who was discussed, has a kind of narrow understanding of social norms. They're norms that solve certain mixed motive games. Uh, I don't think that uh, Peter and I want to think about norms in that limited a way. When we talk about social norms, we mean uh, the sort of thing that Bicchieri would also talk about as descriptive norms, which solve certain um, uh, cooperation rather than coordination games, driving on the same side of the road is is such a norm. So a, a fairly wide range of norms is what we have in mind. In fact, part of what I want to suggest is that the primary epistemic game is doesn't look like it's a mixed motive game at all, um, although it can be then transported into a richer set of choices, the richer sort that um, I would have in mind would be one in which um, I have certain epistemic uh, uh, norms that are going to characterize how I ought to form beliefs and at the same time uh, I have a life and so what I'm trying to do is kind of make a reasonable uh, pursuit of those epistemic norms and there might be notions about what's reasonable in this way that are kind of secondary uh, norms uh, with respect to epistemic norms. Okay, so uh, the paper's really 
somewhat exploratory, in fact, fully exploratory. I don't pretend to have a picture of a kind of a worked out account of games. And so what I'm, I'm a pistemic game. So what I'm going to try to do is kind of sneak up on it in, by doing some things in the vicinity. Uh, so this is kind. This won't work. Something like this will. That's the kind of thing I want to do. So you have to begin by thinking about the character and structure of the costs and benefits central to people's individual and joint epistemic lives within an interdependent community. And what we're looking for is the kind of norms that serve to regulate that practice and solve certain either coordination or cooperation problems faced as a part of that inter interdependent epistemic community. So I'm going to also then think, well, how do you kind of just generally get a, a picture of the kind of values that are characteristically epistemic and use that to think about the epistemic game. So I'm, I'm going to just begin with the idea um, that the norms of one's community resolve in good revolve, excuse me, in good measure around veritistic uh, value. True beliefs are good, false beliefs are bad. One gains when one accepts or holds true beliefs and loses when one accepts or holds false beliefs. And in the course of simply failing to produce true beliefs, one counts as missing out on something that is epistemically valuable but it might be a kind of a piss missing out that is acceptable. Um, okay. So several wrinkles. Um, surely uh, true beliefs may be uh, more or less highly valued. There are practical reasons for that. Some are kind of important in the kind of choices uh, that I'm going to make, practical in character. Um, okay. Uh, one seeks uh, to under understand um, and true, if you think of understanding as a kind of explanation, and you kind of think that a, at least a, a big part of explanation might revolve around something like uh, invariant generalizations, then of course invariant generalizations would be important in that understanding endeavor. I'm going to set those things aside as wrinkles. You might think that some beliefs are just trivial or have to do with trivial matters. Um, I suppose I think so, true. Uh, but even in our thinking about trivia, uh, we still somehow care about truth. I think that's reflected in the way we correct each other, even with respect to trivia. Um, it could also have to do with the way in which the consequences of a belief, that is what it would do for us practically and in terms of understanding, can sometimes be obscure. Uh, in fact, because beliefs work in combination, say, in understanding, whether a belief is trivial might depend upon what other beliefs we have. So it might be the case that we care about true beliefs even when we're uh, Suppose that, at least for now, a belief looks trivial. It may not remain so. I could give you examples if you cared. Uh, so I'm thinking now of epistemic norms as conditioned by this veritistic valuing. Um, and I'm also going to focus primarily on the production of belief, although as we proceed through, we'll see more and more cases where a concern is not just the production of a true belief, but in some sense the communication. And that's certainly going to make sense if you think that not only am I producing true beliefs for me, but I'm counting on you to produce true beliefs for me, and I'm also kind of trying to work with you to produce true beliefs for you. Well then, obviously we're going to end up being quite concerned about certain aspects of that communication. So you would end up not only with norms that govern the production of belief, but also norms that govern the transmission. So the norms for testimony, norms for assertion might all be importantly epistemic beliefs in, in the sense, epistemic norms in the way I'm talking about them. 
Okay, so, um, so in thinking about the epistemic game, we seek to highlight what is distinctively epis what are distinctively epistemic considerations. Um, and here, um, many perspective costs and benefits condition both individual and joint epistemic activity, but are neither matters of artistic value uh, nor I don't know what that sentence says. Uh, so uh, what I have in mind is uh, sleep. I like sleep. Uh, sometimes I even feel the need for it, actually quite often. Uh, and that conditions my epistemic practice, but it's not an epistemic value, although it's nice to get a good night's sleep before you try to present a paper. Um, entertainment, things like that. To the, also, to the extent that there are norms responsive to largely veritistic payoffs, there may be further norms that limit their call on us. So, uh, there are epistemic, and you can think of those kind of norms that limit their call on us as epistemic norms in a kind of extended sense. So there might be an idea of doing a reasonably dutiful job, or there might be being epistemically responsible, where that's a matter of a kind of doing what you should do for your epistemic station. Um, and it would involve the idea that you could kind of go overboard. So. Um, Here's an example of going overboard, I think. Uh, supposedly, um, well, I know that Richard Feynman uh, lost the love of his life fairly early, uh, became enamored with the idea that picking up uh, attractive women was an acquirable skill, even for a physicist, uh, and then proceeded to practice well enough to get married uh, serially. Uh, and um, at least one of his wives, I believe two, divorced him claiming extreme mental cruelty. And their evidence for extreme mental cruelty, uh, at least in one prominent case, was that he did calculus problems in his head while he should be engaged in kind of physically intimate moments which apparently he was engaged in physically intimate moments, but he was still doing calculus problems. And the word on the street is this is alienating to <laughs> some people. Uh, anyway, I don't have a, we won't develop anything worked out here, but I know Sandy Goldberg has a, a lot to say, or at least has acted like he had a lot to say about uh, what you ought to know, uh, and that seems in the ballpark. So. Um, additionally, there are kind of additional costs and benefits that are, can, can become specific to epistemic communities. So if there are norms, and there's enforcement of norms that involve maybe gossiping about people, uh, courting them status, uh, demoting their status, um, then there would be norms for that kind of thing, and those would count as elaborations on epistemic norms. Okay, well, what are the games like? That is, now we try to do something. Um, one leading idea is that one gains, or stands to gain, um, when one's community gains. So in producing a belief, I get a gain from that. And in sharing, you get a gain. You could think of all of our sharing as kind of contribution to a public or a community stock of true beliefs. And so it, you, you might be encouraged to think of this in terms of the public goods game. Now, that won't work, although we'll come back to the idea at the end, I hope. So you then might think about the standard off-the-shelf public goods game, 
which I say is an unsatisfactory model. So here's the standard public goods game. Uh, it turns on sharing some resource. So people are players in a game are accorded um, some stake, uh, and they get to decide what to do with that stake. They're to decide simultaneously what of that stake, you could think of that as a cognitive endowment, they're supposed to um, contribute, uh, to share, to give away. Um, so here you have a contribution, G sub I, uh, that's going to be between zero contributing nothing, and y, which would be the full uh, use of your uh, endowment. Okay. I suppose the endowment here is uh, thought of as um, a cognitive endowment that you can employ uh, well, or you can let set, or you can employ poorly. We're going to just think about employing well or letting set. And uh, so in this game, the standard game, uh, we're going to let, um, okay, we're going to let G, capital G, be the sum of all contributions. So as we jointly decide what to do, we all can, can we're deciding on what to contribute, to share, and in this case, I should say that here in the first part, and pretty much through the talk, I'm going to be supposing that sharing is automatic, frictionless, and perfect, and we know that's not the case, and so we'll want to wonder about the significance of that, and then we'll try to build some of that in. So, if you suppose that communication is that way, then what I produce is already perfectly shared, uh, then my contribution is just my use of my cognitive faculties. Um, okay. Well, in the standard model, what you get is that you um, you have your endowment, often that's just given to you, but in our case it's a cognitive endowment, and you're using it uh, to produce something that we're representing by G sub I, and that's, um, that is the sharing, as it were, of your cognitive endowment. You get then this joint thing, and you get back some of it. So the standard idea here would be uh, you all contribute to that public good and you all get something from that public good, but in that public good what you get is less. For every unit you contribute to the public good, you get less than a unit back from it. Now, why would you then contribute? Well, one story is you would contribute because if we all contributed, uh, and we all, even though we all got less than one out of our um, individual commit unit, you get less than one unit for every unit you contribute. You get more, you get, you all come out very well if everyone contributes. Um, so that's the rough idea. Um, there's one big problem with it as a picture of the epistemic game. And the big problem with it is that when you share, you produce a true belief and then share it, it's not like you don't have the true belief. So so it, it doesn't look like there's any, as it were, incentive for free riding. That is, there's no incentive to set on your endowment 
and not use it to produce true beliefs. Uh, because every true belief you have, you produce, you've got, and because of this assumption about frictionless communication, everyone has. Um, I suppose that's a, a fairly straightforward point. Uh, you may even wonder why I brought it up, except it does seem to me important to think of sharing in this context as something that um, isn't, you don't lose by sharing. There may be opportunity costs associated with sharing, but you don't lose what you've produced by sharing. Okay. So a more promising model may be uh, something along the lines of the stag hunt game. So compared to the hunting of hares in the stag hunt game, the coordinated hunting of stags brings greater benefits for all parties. Um, at the same time, the uncoordinated or unsupported hunting of stags is a pretty sure failure. So the individual reaps the same benefit from hunting hares, whether uh, they hunt hares alone or whether others are out hunting hares. And so you get the payoff in the little table. So if you look at this, you'll notice that this game has two Nash equilibria, either both hunting stags or both hunting hares. There's no motivation for either player to defect unilaterally from either of these combinations of play. It has no dominant strategy, but that is to say that no strategy is best no matter what the other player does. So both agents do best if they coordinate on hunting stags, and the chore is simply to coordinate on that. Uh, but given just these payoffs, it doesn't look like it should be at all hard. Uh, okay. Uh, so this would be a game that it would be pretty straightforward for not norms to solve. And you could wonder whether you could uh, treat the epistemic game on a model for that so we could think about the truth hunt game. So we might start with a similar looking game. It looks like this. Agents can either engage in quality inquiry or free ride, mooching off the work of others. For simplicity, we'll simply assume that high fidelity frictionless sharing of one's results. Um, agents might either coordinate in on quality inquiry, or uh, one or both might engage in free riding, and we'll assume that the payoffs are average expected payoffs in terms of true beliefs, and we get something that looks like this second game. Uh, here, the truth hunt crude. Here you get uh, uh, if the two engage, if the two agents coordinate or both engage in quality inquiry and share the results, they get six true beliefs. We'll suppose during an episode, uh, if they both free ride, they get none. And because of the because of the assumption about sharing, uh, if if one engages in uh, free riding and the other. Uh, engages in uh, quality inquiry, uh, they get the results of that quality inquiry, which we're supposing is three true beliefs. Uh, now you could easily think, well, if you're producing true beliefs and I'm producing true beliefs and we're kind of accommodating others' uh, production, then there might be an interaction effect where we get farther than we would um, because we can rely on each other. So you could simply take into account that kind of uh, interaction effect and you'd have the truth hunt uh, with interaction effects. And here all I did was add another three to the coordinated quality inquiry to reflect the benefits that we get from being able to work with others' production. Um, Well, you, you might worry that, well, at this stage you have to bring in the idea that it's not just 
a question of free writing or engaging in quality inquiry. There's also the engaging in sloppy inquiry. And so you might you might think that, well, sloppy inquiry is going to produce some true beliefs, but maybe fewer. Uh, so you might just deduct a unit of true belief uh, in the production uh, from each of them. And you get a, a result that looks like the truth hunt game with moderately sloppy inquiry. Um, you can run this again. You can say, what about significantly sloppy inquiry? And you can deduct more. And you get a game that's also pictured in those tables. Um, and then you can just compose those two, or largely compose with some uh, extrapolation, those two tables. And you get the truth hunt game with alternative uh, of being quality inquiry, moderately sloppy inquiry, significantly sloppy inquiry, and interaction effects. Um, if you take stock of that table, you start to see these things. Um, well, it, they encourage us in thinking about epistemic norms as social norms as understood by Bicchieri, or, excuse me, they, they, they encourage us in thinking about epistemic norms as norms as understand, understood by Bicchieri, because in none of these cases are there really any motive to, um, from the point of view of the epistemic payoffs, to de defect from quality inquiry. Uh, every time I do, I come out with less. Uh, okay. But they make vivid how we would like to be able to rely on each other. So from the narrowly epistemic point of view, it seems there are no mixed motives, uh, just a concern for quality inquiry. And again, I'm rather focused here on the production end of it and not the communication end of it. So the picture does seem importantly different from the stag hunt game in that quality inquiry is now the single Nash equilibrium and quality inquiry is the dominant strategy. Um, so I think that's right. So plausibly, agents facing these payoffs and having such preferences would take steps to instruct others in the rules or sensibilities constituting their own understandings of quality inquiry. They would take steps to get others on roughly the same page as them. They would correct them with respect to production of true beliefs. They would try to diagnose what those others were doing wrong in particular cases. Of course, the others might be kind of trying to do the same for them, but the idea is that there might emerge a kind of informed consensus, consensus, consensus uh, understanding of quality inquiry that we would have uh, not just come to understand, but to demand or um, Norm it. How did you say it? Norm them. We would norm them. A verb I didn't use before. Uh, so, um, the, the agents would discuss matters with others to ensure that, they near, that they're nearly enough on the same page. They might quiz them. They might send them to schools. They would provide nudges in the forms of feedback in specific cases. Uh, they would provide correction. They'd provide acknowledgement. Uh, further, agents might start to accord status within the epistemic community. In fact, I think this would come quickly. And perhaps further rewards based on the perceived conformity uh, to their sensibilities regarding quality inquiry. Now, there wouldn't be much need to provide incentives 
because the game, at least as described at this point, is there's no mixed motives. You, the motives are already there in the episteme game. The trick would be that if you took the game and tried to put it into a wider context where there are non-epistemic payoffs, then there would be mixed motives. And at that point, there would be a place. You, you would then have a mixed motive game and you'd have a place for kind of punishment and reward uh, that may be important in marginally, as they say, stabilizing conformity to the norms for quality inquiry that you would have developed. Okay. So, connecting this to B. Geary's account, if we are to coordinate in quality inquiry, that is if we're to reap the epistemic payoffs, agents must, must nearly enough have the same uh, understanding of quality inquiry. Uh, so, they must have knowledge of nearly enough the same rules, kind of the terms Bicchieri would have used. Um, there must be a significantly large subset of the population such that for each individual, those individuals know that the rule exists and applies to the situation. Um, they must prefer to conform, which they should, if each production uh, by way of quality inquiry well, has a good prospect of producing a true belief, and true beliefs are valuable or valued. Uh, and they should uh, want others to conform. Okay, so the, the general idea, why there would be an a, a, a norm built up around this kind of game uh, should be fairly straightforward. Now you might wonder, does that mean that epistemic norms are social norms? I suppose you could also suggest that a kind of isolated Robin Crusoe like agent who had a concern for veritistic value, and who doesn't, would produce these, you know, some normative sensibilities. They're probably different from the ones they would produce in a group, because I'm at least supposing that group productivity would also provide information that would condition one's normative sensibilities. We learn how to learn. But you could say, well, do I call that Robinson Crusoe-like normative sensibilities epistemic norms? I suppose I don't think there's any problem in doing so, uh, unless you want to kind of go, oh no, by norms I mean. Uh, and just suppose they're the kinds of things that uh, Bicchieri is talking about. Uh, on the other hand, that there doesn't seem anything wrong with that as long as you allow that individuals would have epistemic normative sensibilities. Uh, so when Peter and I are wondering whether all epistemic, or whether epistemic norms are social norms, I suppose we mean for those of us who aren't Robinson Crusoe-like folk, uh, do we develop normative sensibilities that function to coordinate our epistemic life together so that we get farther in the production of true belief uh, than we would individually? And uh, then it seems pretty straightforward that epistemic norms are social norms. Okay. In any case, I believe that agents in this sort of facing this game would develop the kinds of empirical expectations and they would, if there were kind of counter-rationally defections, they would surely 
uh, marginalized agents who systematically, whose cognitive practice was characterized by systematic defe defection. So, um, so it looks like those would be social norms. None of this articulates much about the character of the rules or norms that they would have developed. Uh, that is, it just says that there'll be these norms that are attentive to the production of true belief, and they would be coordinated because of the character of our epistemic life together. But it doesn't say what the concerns are. It's plausible that they would revolve around things like reliability, uh, probably um, productivity or fecundity, uh, that is, there would be the standard trade-offs between reliability and producing a fair number of beliefs. Um, and so they would be as attentive to the kind of sense for the costliness of various cognitive practices. So, I guess it's good to note uh, the parallel with the non-epistemic social norms, the norms of hunter-gatherers for hunting or for sharing will be informed by the experiences with and understandings or sense for the reliability of various hunting practices. Uh, there might be a way of setting up your hunt so that you were sure of getting one critter uh, but there might be less sure ways that would make it likely to get 10 critters. You know, might be good to run them off a cliff, but maybe running them off a cliff is a little harder than bushwhacking for a single ambush. And so there'd be those kinds of trade-offs there, and it seems to me there'd be those kinds of trade-offs with respect to epistemic norms. Well, let's go back to the public goods game. And you can think of uh, the, a game that's gotten by way of modifying the public goods game in, war, in ways that reflected our earlier misgivings. Um, so this game will model the veritistic gains and losses resulting from a work cycle in the life of an epistemic community. So, by the way, here I was really um, kind of thinking of Kitcher's uh, discussion. I think it's chapter three of the advancement of science, which has always uh, struck me as a very nice model. So, uh, so the agents will begin this work cycle. So the agents uh, the agents will begin with an epistemic endowment representing a community stock of results. So at that time they just have already from previous uh, community activity some stock of uh, jointly possessed uh, true beliefs at the start of the work cycle. Uh, each agent is also given an endowment, which we'll suppose is roughly the same between them, uh, that they could spend in various ways. So they could engage in quality inquiry, or one of three forms of non-quality inquiry. They could mooch, uh, they could engage in sloppy inquiry, or very sloppy inquiry. And we can focus on the use made of the cognitive endowment during the work cycle, in effect, the change in community epistemic endowment within the work cycle. And again, for simplicity, um, we'll ass assume uniformity across agents' cognitive endowments. Now here we can position the term M. Uh, M was the less than one multiplier on um, 
contributions to the public stock in the earlier public goods game. And we can repurpose re, uh, it and use it to represent the marginal return for each player on the contribution of all the other epistemic agents in one's group. So you end up here with two streams. Um, you end up with a, the, the production that the agent gets from their own activity, and you get the the, contra the you get a what's gotten by the agent from the contributions of all others, and that's just in place for this reason. I can then think of my own production as a good that I don't lose as I get give away, and then I can still think about the good gotten from everyone else's contribution. And for the first time, I can have some representation of less than perfect frictionless communication. Right? So, um, so we have for the first time some representation of the significance of communication and transmission, the marginality of the agent's return can be construed as a function of the imperfections in communication or transmission uh, of the results that others are producing within the group. Okay. Uh, so taking those ideas, you could begin by just thinking of a, a simple model in which you suppose that the individual uh, um, that individuals don't engage in sloppy inquiry of any sort, and instead what you get is uh, they're either going to free ride or they're going to engage in quality inquiry, and the result of free riding is no. And so, let's see. So we're going to let G, the capital G, represent the sum of all contributions within the epistemic community resulting from quality inquiry on the part of the respective agents. I wonder if I, yes, I stuck with that, okay. Um, and as we go through, um, we can call each player's level of quality inquiry QI, Q sub I, and we may suppose that the reasonable expected production of true beliefs by each player, I is a linear function of their quality inquiry, individual quality inquiry, uh, and so we could call that G sub I, uh, and that's the agent's own payoff from their individual quality inquiry. And we can let G I also be the agent's contribution of true beliefs to the community stock during the work cycle. Um, that's, um, well, we can do that. <laughs> Uh, so, if in players simultaneously decide about their contributions, their contribution of quality inquiry, their Q sub I, um, and thus their level of individual epistemic contribution, G sub I, okay. we can let G represent the sum of the individual contributions. I guess I've already said this. Uh, So then we can then suppose that the individual's payoff is going to be G sub I plus some return on the community stock capital G minus G sub I, the contribution of all the other agents. And we can let that contribution of others uh, come back to individual agents in a way that um, doesn't presuppose that they get everything individually that the others produce individually. And that's basically uh, the epistemic public goods game. Uh, 
Again, this is not a mixed motive game. And again, there's one Nash equilibrium. Um, but we haven't discussed a sloppy inquiry of any kind. And basically all I suggest is you might then think of um, contributions that involve sloppy inquiry as um, a kind of mix from the various kinds of inquiry. Um, I, w I'm, I think I'm going to pass on that for now. I, how long do I have left? Seven minutes? Okay. I'm going to pass on that for now. Um, So John Greco suggested to me in kind of discussing some of these ideas um, that at least one analogous kind of situation is that of uh, hygiene, where you get the results of your own hygiene uh, and you get the results of others' hygiene in a less direct way. Uh, so one has no motivation within the sort of health uh, context of skipping hygiene. Um, and, and you benefit from others. So it looks like also, again, a, a fairly non-zero-sum, I'm sorry, a fairly um, non-mixed motive game. So again, I think that in these contexts, mixed motives don't come from the epistemic game as I've been playing with it. Uh, they come from sort of embedding the epistemic game into wider games with multiple uh, other dimensions of evaluation. I suppose that um, a lot of this discussion, uh, uh, one thing it hasn't discussed at all is the kind of trade-offs one really does face, and these are epistemic trade-offs, between the production of a belief by quality inquiry and the communication of a belief by, communi by quality inquiry. Um, so when you think back at that uh, last characterization in the epistemic goods game, uh, it looks like you both, I mean, obviously you want to engage in quality inquiry because it maximizes your piece of I, your production of true beliefs individually. But it's also the case that um, you want, a, you want a, a fairly high M multiplier on the production of the other agents. And so you can say, well, what kind of norms facilitate that? And there it's kind of interesting because it looks like the norms there, uh, well, they involve things like uh, going out and telling people, writing up your results, uh, it probably also, another possibility is that insofar as there's some non-quality inquiry, there may be some, in fact, there clearly would be motivation for some kind of filter, you know, like refereeing, if you suppose refereeing amounts to a filter. And so there you can see in connection with uh, this multiplier on the joint stock, you can see a place for the norms for communication, probably norms for the acquisition from others, 
you are a It takes time to find out what others have learned in their various studies, and that's all going to be important here. So while I focused on how norms for production would naturally fit into the norms count, uh, here at the end I'm just signaling that norms for communication and for learning from others, thinking of communication as really having two uh, poles, uh, how, how those would be important in epistemic games. And I think I'll stop.